Hey guys, we're going to get to chapter, right now we're going to read actually chapter 14 and 15. So let's see what happened. Well, at the end of chapter 13, remember that horn honked and bothered Uncle Beasley and he kind of flipped that truck around. So let's see if something happens because of that. Chapter 14. A little later that morning, the District of Columbia Police Department called on the telephone. Dr. Zemer took the call and motioned me to listen in on the other telephone. It was a pretty unusual conversation, so I'll write it down here as close as I can remember it. Hello, Professor, the voice said. This is Captain Neely at the police station. We're just checking up on a report. A man came in early this morning with a crazy story about a big animal with horns. He said he was in his truck at Independence and 15th and saw this thing and thought it was some sort of stuffed animal on wheels. But suddenly it turned around and belted the truck right over on its side. He said he climbed out the window and escaped and came in, came in to report to us. He said he thought he saw someone riding on it. It looked like a kid, he said. Is that so, Dr. Zemer said very calmly. I wouldn't have bothered you, Professor, the voice went on, but the guy was perfectly sober, so we thought we'd better look into it. We went back to Independence and 15th, and there was his truck all right, but it was right side up. The man couldn't explain that, but he swore up and down that when he left, the truck had, the truck had been on its side. I was just going to take the guy back to the station for observation when one of the men found a track over in the dirt near the sidewalk. It was a great big track about 14 inches long with four toes on it. I've never seen anything like it. We called the zoo and they said it sounded like the track of an oversized tortoise, but their tortoise hadn't escaped. And besides, they didn't think a tortoise could turn over a truck. I think they're right, Dr. Zemer said, but the zoo said to get in touch with you people at the museum. So I just wanted to ask if you had any idea what could have made that trek. Why, yes, I have a pretty good idea, Captain, Dr. Zemer said. I'm fairly certain that it was made by a triceratops. A what, the voice said? A triceratops, a kind of dinosaur. It has horns, just like a man said. The All right, Professor, the captain's voice sounded a little sharp. The truck was tipped over this morning, not a million years ago. I know that, the doctor said. We heard the whole story from the boy who was riding the dinosaur. There was a kind of a pause at the other end of the telephone. Would you repeat that, Professor? I didn't catch what you said. I said we heard about it from the boy who was riding the dinosaur. Another pause. I'm sorry, Professor. All I can hear is something that sounds like the boy was riding the dinosaur. I guess our phone's on the blink. That's what I said, Dr. Zemer said patiently. We have a dinosaur. And the boy was out exercising it this morning when that er, incident occurred. Then there was even a longer pause. Finally, the police captain said, I better come over and see you about this. And then he hung up. Later on, the police captain came in. He was a tall man and he had a big chin and looked very serious. Dr. Zemer took him down in the basement and showed him Uncle Beasley. Holy smoke, the police captain said. How long have you had this thing here? Almost three weeks, Dr. Zemer told him. And you mean to say you've been letting him out every morning all this time? Why, that's dangerous. We can't allow a thing like this to wander around the public streets. There was no injury or property damage this morning when the truck was tipped over, but you may not be so lucky next time. You'll have to keep this animal locked up. No more trips around loose after this. He frowned at Uncle Beasley through the gate and started to turn to go, but he turned around quick again quickly. And another thing. Professor, there's a district ordinance against stabling large animals inside the District of Columbia limits, except in designated areas. He took out a booklet and thumbed through it. Cats and dogs, yes. Rabbits, hamsters, guinea pigs, white rats under certain conditions, no. No horses, cows, sheep, goats, pigs, and other livestock. No potentially dangerous animals such as bear, or leopard, raccoon, or ape, or the young of such animals, either caged or or free. No reptiles. Doesn't even mention dinosaurs, Professor. I'm sorry. I'll give you 24 hours to clear him out of here. That's the best I can do for you. He wrote something in his notebook and snapped it shut as if there was no use saying anything more about it. Then he walked out of the building. Well, Nate, Dr. Zemer said, what do we do now? He rubbed his chin for a while. I guess our bet, best bet is the zoo. What do you say? 
I said I guess that was right with me if they would take good care of Uncle Beasley. Oh, I'm so sure they would, the doctor said. He'd be their prize exhibit, and nothing would be too good for him. I'll call Holmquist at the zoo. He's a good friend of mine. He talked on the phone for a while, quite a while, and then he hung up and turned to me. Holmquist said they would be very happy to have a dinosaur. They lost an elephant a while back and have an empty pen in the elephant house. It would be just the thing for him. Big, indoor room, heated, large outdoor pen for warm weather. Much better than his quarters here. There's only one difficulty, he said. What's that, I said. The government. Dr. Zimmer leaned his chin in his hand. There's a big economy drive on now. They do that every now and then. So there's a big squeeze on the Department of Interior and especially on the National Park Service. That's where the National Zoological Park comes in. Their budget has been cut way down. That's why they still have an empty elephant pen. Elephants eat, eat too much and so do dinosaurs meat. Homquist says he wants your dinosaur like anything, but he's worried about his budget. He said to bring him over anyway, and we'd hope for the best. The next morning early, Michael Finney brought around his truck and backed it up to the door of the museum. We loaded Uncle Beasley on pretty gently because he weighed 3,176 pounds now and was over 17 feet long. And then he drove over to the National Zoological Park. It was only about two or three miles. We went up to Connecticut Avenue and then turned off onto Rock Creek Park. Then the truck climbed up the hill to the elephant house, past a sign that said, Lost Articles and Children Will Be Taken to the Lion House. I thought that was pretty rough on children, because it must be kind of easy to get lost in a big zoo like that. We drove around to the back of the elephant house, and Mr. Holmquist met us there. They had a ramp, and they moved that back up that up to the back of the truck, and we eased Uncle Beasley out backwards. It was slow work, but we finally managed it. And then I led him into the inner pen and showed him the water trough and the feed rack. Then I showed him around the outer pen. From his pen, he could see the hippopotamuses and the giraffes, so he wouldn't be too lonely. The keeper put in the big pile of alfalfa and feed, and Uncle Beasley started right in on it. We'll come up every day to measure and weigh him, Dr. Seymour said, and we thanked Mr. Holmquist and drove away in the truck. So far, so good, the doctor said. Now we'll wait and see what Congress does when they hear about it. I think it was about three days later that Mr. Holmquist called the museum and told us that Congressional Committee was coming out to the zoo to look into the question of the dinosaur. You better come right over to answer questions about your animal, he suggested. Uncle Beasley was in fine shape when we got there. He'd put on a lot more weight as usual and was rubbing his shoulder against the bars in a very comfortable way. Dr. Zemer nudged me and pointed to a group of four men that had just walked in. They took a quick look around the room and walked right over toward the dinosaur cage. This must be the one over here, one of the men said. He had a bald head and smoked a cigar. The other men gathered around and stared at Uncle Beasley. A keeper came along and tossed three bags of alfalfa and a bag of grain into his hopper. How long does he take to eat that feed, the man with the cigar said. Oh, he finished all that up in half an hour, the keeper said. He's got a real appetite, that boy. He takes eight sacks of alfalfa and 200 pounds of grain every day. It does your heart, heart good just to watch him eat. Did you hear that, Ed, the man with the cigar said? That's where the money goes. What do they call that kind of animal anyway, another of the men said. Dr. Zemer stepped forward. That's a triceratops, gentlemen, he told them. I've never seen anything like that around anywhere, another man said. Where did he come from? From the town of Freedom, New Hampshire, Dr. Zemer told them. The boy here raised him from the time he was hatched. Kind of an ugly brute, isn't he, the man said. Is there any particular reason for keeping him here at the taxpayer's expense? Well, he's the only animal of this kind in the world, as far as we know, Dr. Zemer said. We think it's very important that scientists be able to study such a rare specimen as this. It's a wonderful thing for Americans to have live, have a live triceratops right here in the National Zoo. I don't know about that, the man with the cigar said. It's time that people learn that United States government is going to pay for every fool notion that turns up. He pointed his cigar at Dr. Zemer and me. I'd like you to you two to come to the Senate office building tomorrow at 11 a.m. I want to look into this little manner of your dinosaur, Senator Granderson's office. 
He turned around and walked out of the elephant house with the other men following him. So we're on to chapter 15. Let's what let's see what they tell him. In the morning, Dr. Zemer and I went up to the Senate office building. It's a big building right next to the Capitol where the senators work and figure things out when they're not in the Senate making laws and speeches and things like that. We found Senator Granderson's office on the second floor and walked in. After we had waited around for a while, a secretary told us to step into the inner office. Senator Granderson was sitting in the middle of a cloud of cigar smoke, and he got up and shook Dr. Zemer's hand. He shook my hand, and then he pointed to some chairs for us to sit in. He sat down behind a big desk with a glass top. Senator Granderson cleared his throat and leaned back in his chair. Now, gentlemen, he said, I want you to understand that I have no personal objection to this dinosaur. I have no doubt that it is an excellent animal uh, in its own way. My only interest in the matter is to save money for taxpayers. My committee is trying hard to find ways of cutting down the expenses of the government. We want to get rid of anything that isn't absolutely necessary for the welfare of the American people. And right here in the District of Columbia, in our own National Zoological Park, we find a big expensive animal eating up feed by the ton. Now I ask you gentlemen, how is a Tyrannosaur like that going to help the welfare of the American people? Triceratops, Dr. Zemer said. All right, doctor, Senator Granderson said. You can call it anything you like, but the point is, what good is it? But Senator, Dr. Zemer said, you might just as well ask what good is an elephant? They're expensive to feed too. Oh, elephants are quite another matter, the senator said. An elephant is a standard, well-recognized animal. You read about them in books and you see them in the circus. They are a solid part of our wholesome American tradition. The elephants have been a symbol of one of our greatest political parties, but of course you can have too many of them. One elephant is enough for a zoo. No need to have more than one. But Senator, there are different kinds of elephants, Dr. Zemer said. There are Indian elephants and African elephants, for instance. Don't you think the public should have a chance to see more than one kind of elephant? Now, doctor, the senator said, patting his big hand on the desk. An elephant is an elephant, and that's all the man on the street needs to know. If it's an American zoo, it can be an American elephant. Why should we worry where it comes from? But I want to get back to this dinosaur of yours. Where did you get it from? Dr. Zemer nodded to me, so I answered the question. It came from our chicken yard, I told him. Where is that? The senator wanted to know. Up in Freedom, New Hampshire. I see, the senator said. And just what was this animal doing in the chicken yard? One of our hens laid it. She was part Rhode Island Red and part Barred Plymouth Rock. The senator raised his eyebrows. You mean to tell me that this teradoc, this dinosaur hatched out of a hen's egg? That sounds mighty suspicious to me. Are you sure someone didn't slip this egg into your hen house when you weren't looking? Did you see this, this, any suspicious characters around your place at the time? Yes, I mean, no, I said, because I wasn't quite sure what the question was answering. But anyways, I said, the hen hatched it out. She sat on it faithfully for six weeks. It was a long job. But Senator, Senator Granderson wasn't listening. He sat frowning at down at the desktop for a while. Then he looked up at Dr. Zemer. You ever seen any din dinosaur eggs before, doctor? Oh, yes, Dr. Zemer said. We have many of them. Where'd they come from, the senator wanted to know. From the Gobi Desert or Outer Mongolia, Dr. Zemer said. But those were eggs of the pro protoceratops. And Drew C., the senator thumped his fist down on the desk. Gentlemen, he said. I know now what I must do. My duty is clear. This animal does not belong in our National Zoological Park. He is not an American animal. And our National Zoo is no place for him. We must not maintain foreign freaks at the public expense. Lions, tigers, giraffes, all the proper animals, yes. But no un-American, outmoded creatures from the foreign places. The dinosaurs are extinct, aren't they? Do you want people to get the false idea such things still exist right here in America? But Senator, Dr. Zemer said, Do Senator Granderson raised his big hand. No, doctor, he said, don't attempt to dissuade me. I see my duty today in the Senate. I shall propose legislation to make it unlawful to keep any out-of-date, unusual, unlikely animals in the National Zoo or in the national parks or anywhere within the borders of the United States or its possessions.
He got up from his chair and walked over to the door and opened it for us. I will be very busy now, gentlemen, so I must say goodbye. Thank you for your time. The next thing we knew, Dr. Zima and I were out in the corridor. The doctor stared down at the floor and he looked very discouraged. Well, Nate, things don't look very bright for Uncle Beasley. Perhaps it would have been better if we just let him stay up in New Hampshire. It's really my fault for getting him into this difficulty. It isn't your fault, Dr. Zemer, I said. You were just trying to do the best thing you could for him. You didn't know that things would turn out this way. Dr. Zemer and I went back to the museum. The doctor sat down on the edge of his desk and stared out the window. Then he got up and walked back and forth on the rug with his hands jammed down his pockets. Finally, he stopped and turned to me. I always feel so helpless when I get tangled up with Congress, he said. I don't expect understand how their minds work. I know an archaeopteryx when I see one, and I can tell an ichiosaur from a playsaur or trilobite from a greptolite, but I don't know anything about senators. Why do you suppose Senator Granderson doesn't like dinosaurs, I asked him. What's he got against them? Dr. Zemer shrugged his shoulders. I haven't any idea. He just gets a whim every now and then, usually just before elections that he's got to do something to save the country. Last year, he was going to save the country from comic books. Maybe you heard about that one. The year before, it was firecrackers. Next year, it'll be basketball or outboard motors. You never can tell what'll be next. And the strange thing is, he can get people so excited, they think he's right. He got everyone so worked up about cat pistols, and now they're illegal in every state except Nevada and Idaho, and they use nothing but real guns there anyway. One time he proposed a law to get rid of all the buffalo on the government ranges out west. And he almost got it through the Senate. After lunch, Dr. Zemer took me to the gallery above the Senate. And we found some seats right by the front where we could look over the railing and see what just about everything was going on down below us. One of the senators was making a speech about American broadly tobacco. But I didn't listen to him because I was worried about what was going to happen to Uncle Beasley. Pretty soon, Dr. Zemer nudged me, and I looked down and saw Dr. Senator Granderson walking into the room. The man was talking about tobacco, finally sat down, and the other senators clapped a little, though, but not very hard. The next thing I knew, Dr. Senator Granderson was standing up beside his desk. Mr. President, he said in a big, booming voice, I wish to speak today about a subject that affects us all. My fellow senators all know me as one who constantly devoted himself to the welfare and safety of the American people, and I'm sure they will listen carefully as, as I describe a situation which is not only needless expense to the American taxpayer, but which also constitutes a grave danger to every man, woman, and child in this great land of ours. He paused for a while, looked around the room as if expected everyone to clap. I need not remind you that our government is trying to reduce its top-heavy budget and to lower the staggering tax burden that strains the backs of all American citizens. I myself have spent many weary hours seeking out waste and unnecessary expense in the various branches of our federal establishment. You can imagine my dismay when I discovered an example of such waste right here in our national capital. I am grieved to say this, gentlemen, but right here in our national zoological park, is an animal that is squandering the taxpayers' hard-earned money at the disgraceful rate of $21.60 a day, every day of the week, Saturdays and Sundays included. And what is more, gentlemen, it, that this animal is absolutely worthless. It does no honest work, it pulls no plow, it grows no wool, and what is even more, gentlemen, in this animal I speak of, is no normal creature like lions and tigers and elephants that roam the woods and plains of our fair country. Someone nudged the senator when he said this, and leaned over and whispered with him, Of our fair country, I say? Dr. Grenderson went on, Or the woods and plains of our sister nations across the seas. No decent, ordinary, up-to-date animal is this, gentlemen, but a freakish survivor of a race that died out millions of years ago, perhaps hundreds of millions of years ago. That's stretching it pretty far, Dr. Zemer whispered to me. 70 million years is the most I can allow him for the Triceratops. They were no earlier than the late Mesozoic. The senator raised his big hand over his head and waggled a finger at the other senators, the way Miss Watkins does when she's getting ready to scold us in class. The animal I speak of is a dinosaur gentleman of the type known as the Tyranna, rather I should say Triplo, no that's not it. The scientific name escapes me at the moment, gentlemen, but it makes no difference what we call it. It's still the ugliest, evilest-looking rip 
reptilian I've ever seen, and it's a disgrace to our National Zoological Park and to the department that operates. Can you imagine for one moment bringing the, the innocent, bright-eyed children of good American families to look at this inefficient, outmoded, outlandish specimen of a bygone age? Do we want our children to grow up to be looking forward, citizens of our forward-looking country, forward looking country? Then we must not let them dwell on the useless creature of the past, the foolish mistakes of nature discarded long before Columbus planted the American flag on our beautiful shores. No, gentlemen, there must not be, there must be no living in the past for us, but rather we must bravely face the future and march on together, hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, so to the glorious destiny that lies before us. Some of the senators clapped, and Senator Granderson took a few swallows of water from glass on his table. I propose to get rid of this monster, Senator Granderson went on. I'm submitting a bill before the Senate to make the possession of all unnatural animals a federal offense. He should be exterminated, exterminated, and sooner the better. Another man near Senator Granderson stood up. I agree with the Honorable Senator. I want to propose an amendment to this bill. I propose that this dinosaur be skinned and stuffed and presented to Senator Granderson as a trophy in recognition of his untiring work in searching our waste and error in the national government. I pulled Dr. Zemo's sleeve when I heard that. Would they really do that to Uncle Beasley, I asked him in a whisper. Not if we can help it, Nate, Dr. Zemo said. Then another senator got up. What does this dinosaur eat, he wanted to know. It eats grain and alfalfa, Senator Granderson told him. Tremendous amounts of it. And he's growing bigger and bigger. He eats more every day. Soon we shall all be starving just to satisfy the appetite of this gluttonous beast. He slapped his fat stomach to kind of emphasize what he said. Well, the other senator said in a sort of a drawly voice, my constitutes in Nebraska will be happy to have him eat all the alfalfa he wants, Senator. Why wouldn't it be a good idea to feed him government stores of surplus grain and alfalfa? We could feed the animal for years on that and what it costs us a cent. We've been trying to think of some way to use up all that surplus. How about that? Never. Senator Granderson roared. I wouldn't dream of giving away this surplus food to an ugly beast when the hard-working American housewife has to buy it with their hard-earned money. The American housewife doesn't eat much alfalfa, Senator, a man from the back row. There was a lot of laughter, and the vice president had to knock on his desk to quiet things down. Well, the arguments went on this way for a long time, and nobody seemed to be getting anywhere. Dr. Zemer didn't look very happy, and he kept shaking his head every now and then. Nate, he said, I don't know how this is going to come out, but the senators will probably go on making speeches at each other until midnight, and there won't be enough of them here to take a vote, so they'll postpone it till tomorrow. We might as well go home and get some sleep. We got up and went out. Dr. Zemer didn't say anything all the way back to the apartment. He just walked along looking at the sidewalk. I could tell that he was worried and that made me worried. After I'd crawled into bed, the doctor came in to say goodnight to me. He sat down on the edge of the bed after I turned out the light. He didn't say anything. He just sat there looking kind of tired and discouraged. I guess there isn't much hope for Uncle Beasley, I said, trying to sound calm, but my voice came out a little quivery. Well, we won't give up till we have to, he said. It doesn't look too good for us, but we may think of something yet. I sat up in bed suddenly. Do you think we could slip over to the zoo with the truck and load Uncle Beasley into it and sneak him away and hide him somewhere? They couldn't kill him if they couldn't find him, could they? The doctor shook his head. It would be pretty hard to hide anything so big, Nate. A triceratops wasn't really made for running away from things. When something attacked him, he would meet the trouble head on. That's why a triceratops has all these horns and armor plates on the front end. And he was a tough customer, too. Even the ty tyrannosaur would think twice about taking on a triceratops. Maybe we'd better take a lesson from Uncle Beasley. I don't think we'd get anywhere trying to run away from the trouble. It would catch up with us sooner or later. We'll keep thinking, but it's terribly late. You get to sleep now or you'll never wake up till lunchtime. He closed the door slowly behind him. I didn't go to sleep for a long time trying to think of some way to save Uncle Beasley. I could hear Dr. Zemer walking up and down in the next room. He was still walking when I went to sleep. We will read chapter 16 and 17 next time and see, do they save Uncle Beasley? I hope they do. Bye.